Chapter 10 So, the end of the week came around, as the end of the week always does. The old author heaved a sigh of relief to think there would be no mail on this day, for on a Saturday in Montreal there is no mail delivery. So, while the highly paid mailmen were resting in their country cottages or going out fishing in their boats, the old author lay back in his bed and grumpily considered all the questions which still had to be answered. Here is a question which comes up time after time. It is, To me, it is most important to know where I am going. Once a man is born, you state that it is somewhat like a mother giving birth to a child, but with the silver cord still remaining attached. You state that the over-self is the nine-tenths of the subconscious of man, or, so to speak, the man behind the scenes. All right, if this be so, then let us get to the man. He starts out limited to his one-tenth, and thus runs around in the dark most of his life. The man dies, he has done his job for the over-self, the silver cord is severed, and he is on his own. What does the over-self give him for his efforts? Well, all right, let us get down to it. Yes, that is a question which can be answered. But you must remember that the over-self is the real you, and it is, as far as earth terms are concerned, blind, deaf, and static, but of course only as far as this low earth is concerned. The over-self wants to know what things are like on this earth. It wants sensation fast because in the realm in which the over-self normally lives, things move at the rate of a thousand years or so instead of a day. That is why in one of the Christian hymns there is that piece about a thousand years being the twinkling of an eye. But anyway, the over-self can be likened to the brain of a human. The over-self causes a human or more than one human to do certain things and to experience certain things, and all the sensations are relayed back to the brain over-self, who then vicariously enjoys or suffers from those sensations. We have difficulties, you know, because upon this earth we are dealing with only three dimensions and only three-dimensional terms. So how are we to get over concepts which demand perhaps nine dimensions? You ask what sort of reward does the over-self give to the human for all the experiences which have been undergone, but there is a good question to ask in return. It is this. What reward do you give your fingers for turning a doorknob and opening a door for you? What payment do you give to your feet for conveying you along to another room in the house, or to your car for pushing you upstairs? How do you pay your eyes for sending your brain those beautiful pictures? Remember... If you are the brain and you are dependent upon hands and feet and nose and eyes, all those organs are dependent upon you for their existence. If you did not exist, those hands, feet, nose and eyes would not exist either. It is completely a cooperative effort. If your fingers light a cigarette, your fingers do not enjoy the smoke. Possibly another part of you does. But anyhow, when your fingers light a cigarette, other organs do not reward those fingers with kind words or expensive gifts by way of thanks. But even if you wanted to reward those fingers, how would you do it? What could you give to your fingers that would please them and reward them adequately? And if the real you is the brain, then how can the brain, which is dependent upon those fingers, operate to reward those fingers? Do you make the left hand give a gift to the right hand, and then the right hand give a reciprocal gift to the left hand, or what? Keep in mind always that the fingers are dependent on the brain for direction. The fingers are dependent upon you. So there is a reward, because just as the fingers and the toes are part of the whole body, so you are just part of the whole organism, which constitutes the extension of the over-self. Here, on this earth... You're just an extension in the same way as if you can thrust an arm through a window and feel things in a room beyond, a room beyond the range of your sight. So there you are. You're working for yourself. Anything you do here benefits your over-self, and so benefits you, because you are the same thing, or a part of it. The same querist has another question which is applicable, and it is, if the said man must be reincarnated, does he go back to the same over-self, or does he get a new one? Is he a sort of a permanent part of the over-self? Is man suddenly endowed with the other nine-tenths of the consciousness, or what happens? The answer to this, well, your question really is, 
Does the same body or spirit come down from the over-self? Let us suppose you get a cut on your hand. You don't get a fresh hand, do you? The hand, or rather the cut, heals because it is part of you, because it is directed by your brain to heal. It goes through the process of joining together. People are entities complete so that your over-self can direct extensions to itself to come down to earth. And those extensions, humans, are something like the tentacles of an octopus. Cut off a tentacle, and it will regrow. My, oh my, what a lot of confusion there is about this over-self business. But in an earlier part of this book, the matter should have been clarified somewhat. To add, possibly, a little more light, let us suppose that we have a big entity which has powers which we do not at present understand. This entity has the ability to think and thereby to cause extensions of itself to shoot out wherever desired. Pseudopods, they are called. So, our over-self, remaining in one place, has the ability to cause extensions to be sent away from the main body, but still attached to it. And, at the end of the extensions, there is a node of consciousness, which can be aware of things through touch, or through sight, or through sound. Nodes of consciousness, which merely receive on different frequencies. Everything is vibration. There is nothing but vibration. If we think that an article is stationary, then it is merely vibrating at one particular rate. If a thing is moving, then it is vibrating at a faster rate. And even if a thing is dead, it is still vibrating and actually breaking up as the body decomposes into different vibrations. We feel a thing, no matter whether it is stationary or moving. We touch it, and we feel it because it has a certain vibration, which can be received and interpreted by one of our nodes attuned to that type of frequency. In other words, we are sensitive in the sense of touch. Another article is vibrating much more rapidly. We cannot feel it with our fingers, but our ears pick up that vibration, and we call it sound. It is vibrating in that range of frequencies which a higher receiving node can receive as a high sound, an intermediate sound, or a low sound. Beyond that there is a range of frequencies which are much higher. We cannot touch them, we cannot hear them, but even more sensitive nodes termed eyes can receive those frequencies or vibrations and resolve them inside our brain into a definite pattern, and so we get a picture of what the thing is. We get much the same thing in radio. We can listen in to the AM band, which is a fairly coarse vibration or frequency, or we can go to the shortwave bands, which are much faster frequencies, which an AM receiver will not receive. And we can also go down, or should it be up, to the FM frequencies or the UHF frequencies, where we can pick up television pictures. The radio receiver for television will not pick up AM or shortwaves, just as the AM or shortwave receiver will not pick up television pictures. So, there we have an everyday illustration of how we can put our extensions to receive vibrations of a special frequency. In just the same way, the overself puts out nodes, pseudopods, humans, to pick up something which the overself wants to know about. Horrid thought for you, something to make your flesh creep before you go to bed. We have seen how humans make things to pick up AM radio or FM or short waves. Supposing your overself regards this earth as just AM, then the overself could have pseudopods out in higher frequencies, eh? So sometimes you get a nightmare where the poor old overself has got his lines crossed and you pick up impressions of bug eyed monsters, etc. Well, there are such things, you know. The author picked up another letter and shuddered. He had no mirrors about, but had there been a mirror available, it would have been observed that the author turned very pale, shockingly pale. And why? How about this for a question? I have a question, and it is this. If a puppet can enter either a male or female body, depending on what it wants to learn, why is it always taken for granted that the entity which was the Dalai Lama will always incarnate as a man? Surely even this entity needs a change if it is to learn things generally rather than purely from the male viewpoint. And why can a woman never aspire to the highest level of lamahood? In Tibet, where I understand men and women are equal, or where before the Chinese arrived, why this discrimination? Once again... A question can be partly answered by a question. 
Here is a question which may help. Where in all history has there been a woman as a supreme god? Can you readers tell of a single instance where a woman has been the supreme god? Yes, there have been goddesses, but they have been inferior to the gods. The Dalai Lama was a god on earth according to Tibetan belief, and so, as a god on earth, being a goddess on earth would not suffice. He came in male form because the things he had to do necessitated that he came in male form. But how do you know that the over-self of the Dalai Lama does not have female puppets elsewhere learning other things? As a matter of fact, he did. As a matter of fact, much was being learned on the female side also. This particular author has a screw loose about certain things. One is about the moronic press, and another is about the so-called women's liberation movement. This particular author firmly believes that women have a very important job in life, raising the future population. If women would only stop aping men, and they do definitely try to ape men and try to wear the pants, forgetting that they don't have the figure for it, then the world would be a better place. This author believes that women are responsible for most of the troubles of the world through wanting to get out and be free, as they wrongly term it, instead of accepting their responsibilities as mothers. Women say they want to be equal, but are they not equal? Which is most important, a dog or a horse? They are different creatures. Men and women are different creatures. A man has never given birth without the assistance of a female, let us say, but a female can give birth without the assistance of a male by parthenogenesis. So, if the woman's live movement wants a boast, why not boast about that? What greater proof of equality or even superiority can there be than that woman had the task of providing and bringing up the future race? The male cooperation in the matter only takes a few minutes, but a woman, well, she should bring up children until they are able to get on by themselves, and how she brings them up, the example that she sets them, that is how the future race will be. But now women want to beetle off to the factory where they can talk scandal. They want to be a hash slinger or anything except to accept the responsibility for which she is so well qualified by nature. Women's liberation? I think the sponsors of the women's liberation movement should be slapped across the backside hard. The question goes on to ask why women never aspire to the highest lamahood, because women are irrational. That is why, because women cannot think clearly. That is why, because women let their emotions run away with reason. That is why. If women would only stop being such asses and face up their responsibilities, then the whole world, the whole universe, would be a better place. Women have the biggest task of all. Women have the task of staying at home, making a home, and setting an example that future generations can follow. Are women not big enough to do their tasks? Another question, what is the best incense to use? That is something which cannot be answered, because it is much the same as saying, what is the best dress to wear, what is the best food to eat, one cannot say what is the best of anything until one knows for what purpose it is required. Briefly, so that this shall not be entirely negative, here are some comments. You should try different types, try different brands of incense, and you should decide which is the best type for you when you are peaceful or when you are irritated or when you want to meditate. Decide which is the best for you on those occasions and lay in a good supply of those types. Incense should always be thick sticks. The thin stuff is practically useless. It is like having a musical note. If you get a thin, reedy note, it merely irritates, it merely aggravates one. But if you have a good, full-bodied note, then that can be peaceful, soothing, or stimulating. So, never be fobbed off with a thin stick of incense. If you use that, you are wasting your money. Sticks are to be preferred rather than powders or cones. As to where to get the stuff, well, that is another matter. But please be very sure that there is no such thing as ramper incense. Lobsang Ramper does not endorse any particular supplier. He does not endorse any particular incense. Many people have come out with blatant advertisements for Ramper this and Ramper that. But Lobsang Ramper has no business interests of any kind whatsoever.
Sometimes there is a request for where to obtain a certain book or other items, and then a name and address is given, but these are ordinary suppliers and are entirely and absolutely unconnected with Lobsang Ramper. Other firms advertise that they are, the third eye this or something that, but again it must be emphasised because of these advertisements that Lobsang Ramper does not endorse any of them, he does not favour any of them, and he does not necessarily deal with any of them. Oh, oh, said the old author. Miss Cleo sat up with her ears erect and her whiskers sticking straight out, looking the absolute epitome of alertness and interrogation. The old author smiled at her and said, Hi, Clee, listen to this. We've got a letter here from a pressman. He is a press reporter with a so-and-so, so-and-so newspaper in the city of so-and-so and something else. He's very cross, Clee, because he's read one of the Ramper books referring to the cowardly men of the press. He thinks the press are God-inspired. The press have a right to write anything they want about people because they are doing holy work. Holy work. Do you hear that, Clee? asked the old author. This press man asked for a definitive statement from Lobsang Ramper of how the press do any harm. The press, he says, do only good. The press could be an instrument of tremendous good, but so could television. But both pander to the lowest emotions of mankind. Sadism, sensuality, superstition, and assorted sinfulness. The big complaint against the press is that they burst into print without being sure of their facts. The press get hold of some rumour, and immediately they print it as absolute fact. And if the rumour is good and the press distort it because sensationalism and sadism seem to sell more successfully than anything good. The press talk about their freedom, the freedom of the press, but how about freedom for individuals? If the press are to have freedom to write whatever they want to write, then the people about whom they write should also be afforded equal space in the columns of the papers to refute the lies which the press have written, Instead of that, if any attempt at refutation is made, the press takes sentences out of context and write up a thing which becomes perfectly damning and it appears to emanate from the person concerned, but is actually just a mishmash of statements taken haphazardly, or perhaps not haphazardly, perhaps with that devilish cunning which only press reporters seem to possess. Many people who are not in a position to defend themselves are attacked by the press, Charlie Chaplin, for example, has been attacked and attacked and attacked most unfairly by the press. Prince Philip is another. He also has been attacked and has no means of defending himself. What about the freedom of the press? How about the freedom of the people who are attacked? The press cause wars and race hatred. The press print only that which is sensational and which is calculated to stir up trouble. Without the press, there would probably have been no war in Vietnam, there would have been no war in Korea. Without the press causing race hatred, there would be not so much trouble between different colours of humans. And now the government of the United States is having great trouble because the press, against the wishes of the government, have burst into print with matters which should be kept quiet. Every person has something which he wants to keep private. Every person has something which, while perfectly all right within the family, might look a bit off to an outsider who did not know the exact facts and circumstances. The same appears to be the case with these Pentagon papers which the press are now purveying as sensational things. It is causing trouble in Canada, England, France and many other countries just because the press people want a few extra cents for their newspapers. In this author's opinion, the press is the most evil force which has ever existed upon this world. In this author's opinion, Unless the press be checked and controlled and censored, the press will eventually control the world and lead to communism. The old author lay back and smiled at Miss Cleopatra as he said, Well, Clee, I wonder if that awful fellow, that press reporter with the dot 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 newspaper in the city of dot dot dot, will take this to heart. I hope so. It could be one step towards salvation for him to leave his job with the press and take something decent elsewhere. But let us turn aside from the press and deal with some more questions. They are never-ending, aren't they?
but it shows that there is a great need for some source whereby the questions may be answered, even partially. Here, from England, are some questions and the answers. Number 1. Is it wrong to have an animal put to sleep when it is suffering and is perhaps incurably ill? As a Buddhist, one should not take life, but there are certain things which are greater than any of the established religions, whether it be Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, or anything else, and this is what one might term a duty to the over-self. In this author's opinion, it is definitely kinder to the animal to have it painlessly killed if, according to the present state of veterinary knowledge, it is incurable. If an animal is suffering from such an illness that veterinary science cannot alleviate its suffering, then it is better to get a veterinarian to destroy it as painlessly and as quickly as can be. That is kind. This particular author is very, very experienced in this matter of pain, having had more than his fair share, and as such he would have welcomed another stronger force which could put him out of his pain permanently. Suicide is something quite different. Suicide is wrong. Suicide is very, very wrong indeed. And those who are contemplating suicide truly have the balance of their mind disturbed by sorrow, pain, or by other circumstances which affect their judgment. Euthanasia would not be suicide, because euthanasia would use the judgment of mature minds who were not directly involved, and as such were not swayed by distressing emotions, who are not swayed by self-pity or by pain. Suicide, according to this author's belief, is irrevocably wrong and should never be resorted to. If an animal is ill, it should be put out of its misery. If a human is ill, incurably so, and of an advanced age where he is a burden to others, then there should be a form of euthanasia in which the matter could be discussed with those who have no personal interest. This next question has bearing on the one above, because the question is, would it be possible to have an animal sent back during a human's life? The answer is, of course, yes, if it were to the animal's benefit, so that if this, of course, is just by way of a purely hypothetical example, and must not be taken too seriously, an animal is put out of his misery without having done his job, then it is possible that that same animal could elect to come back to the same family as a young kitten or a young puppy, and live out that period of time of which it had been deprived by being put to sleep, as an alleviate of suffering. It does happen, but of course, if an animal is on the other side of life, and if the owner can do astral travel, then they can meet if they both desire it. The next question, does the astral form have an aura, or only the physical? The physical form the basic form down here on earth has an etheric and an aura both are just reflections of the life form within many people cannot see the aura most people cannot see the aura because they are so used to it in the same way that most people cannot see the air in which they live all they can see is the smog and there is plenty of that to see nowadays in the astral world the aura is much bigger around astral figures and the greater the degree of evolution of an astral figure the more brightly the oral flashes, scintillates, and undulates. So the answer is yes. Very definitely there is an aura around astral figures, but just as on the earth some people cannot see the aura, so there are those in the lower astral who cannot see the astral aura. That is a matter which improves as the non-seer's evolution increases. This person in England asks some very sensible questions. It is from a very intelligent Englishwoman. Do you get that, listener? I am praising a woman. Would it be permissible, asks the question, to use information gained from the Akashic record to write true histories of ancient civilizations and true biographies of famous people? No, because you would not be believed. Ancient history resembles printed history only by accident. History is written or rewritten or erased according to the whim of dictators, etc. A fairly modern example is the history of Nazi Germany. It is fairly common knowledge that history was altered a bit so that Hitler appeared to be something different from what he really was. It is fairly common knowledge also that Russian history has been altered to suit the communist dictators 
So the whole point is, if you wrote the truth from the Akashic record, you would find that it was not believed because it diverged so greatly from the official history of the country concerned. In the matter of biographies, etc., well, if one writes the truth, one cannot often get it published. And if it is published, there is usually an awful commotion after, because some pressman turns up a faint rumour, and he breathes heavily on the flame until he makes a roaring furnace which consumes the truth. If you want the real truth, you will have to wait until you go into the astral to live. I say, Miss C., you've got some good questions. I'm going to use another of yours. You say, is abortion always wrong? I say, no. It is often very much better to have an abortion rather than to bring into an already overpopulated world some poor little wretch who will not be wanted and who may have an extremely difficult time through no fault of his own. After all, why should he be penalised for a few moments of carelessness on the part of the parents? If there is an early abortion, then an entity has not yet taken possession of the body. By the way, reader who complained of too many eyes, surely by the time I have reached the stage of the book, I can cease to be an old author and can be an old man instead, because I assure you I am not an old woman. Anyway, in my books I try to keep the personal touch because we are all friends together, aren't we? We are not stuffed ducks standing on pedestals. Get yourself on a pedestal and you can soon get knocked off. Here is another of our soul questions. It is, if the soul leaves a person who has become like a cabbage, should the medical profession keep all the cabbages alive by purely mechanical means? A personal opinion is no. When a person gets to such a stage that the entity is no longer there and life is being sustained entirely by mechanical means, then it is wrong and foolish to sustain that life. Under such conditions, mechanical means should be stopped and the body should be allowed to die. This is the kindest method. One hears so much nowadays of absolutely incurable people who are longing to die, who are being kept alive with whacking great tubes stuck in them and all sorts of devilish electronic devices. Well, that is not life, that is living death. Why not let them go home? With the population explosion, there is increased pressure on the wildlife and wild places of the world. Will these survive, or will man ruin his environment forever? Many animals, birds and fish will die and their species will be eliminated for all time from this earth. Mankind is insatiable and voracious. Mankind has no thought for the people of the wilds, but only for putting a few more bucks in his pocket. As this is being written, there is a scheme here in the province of Quebec, whereby millions of acres of land is going to be denuded of its trees to go into the paper-making industry, because from some of these paper products newspapers are printed, artificial leather is made, and many other products which man now finds indispensable to his existence for some reason. With the felling of the trees there will be no insects, no birds, no places for the birds to nest, no food for them, and so they will starve. Animals without shelter and without food will starve also. Man is committing suicide and ruining his world fast. With the removal of the trees there will be different thermal currents. The temperature of the trees cause air to rise and rain to fall, so without the trees there will be a climatic change. It could become a desert area in Quebec where the trees are being felled by the millions. The roots of the trees reach out into the soil and keep it together in a solid mass. Where the trees are felled and the roots pulled up, there will be nothing holding the soil together. So the winds will come and blow the light soil into the air, leaving desert areas reminiscent of the Dust Bowl of America. Mankind is ruining his world because of his quite insatiable money-grabbing. If people would only live more naturally without some of these synthetic compounds, then they would be happier. As things are now, with all the developments of mankind, there is more and more pollution of the air and of the water and the soul, and soon there will come the point of no return when the earth will become barren and uninhabitable. Many people in high places out of this earth, out of this world, are working hard to influence mankind, so that this insensate destruction of the wild places of life shall be stopped, and so that nature shall be afforded an opportunity of restoring the ecology to that which is most suitable for man's continuance 
and for man's evolution. But what is this? A large brown envelope inside of which there was a folded newspaper and a letter. The old author looked at the paper and put it aside quickly as it was a French language newspaper and he did not read French. The letter was in English. It said that the newspaper had an article by a man who was saying that Lobsang Ramper was ill and had retired and that he, the subject of the article, had now taken over as Lobsang Ramper's successor. The writer of the letter wanted to know who was this successor to Lobsang Ramper. Was it true? There have been many people who claim to be Lobsang Ramper, but about this newspaper article first. No, I have no successors. No, I have no disciples, no students. I have no one who is my heir. When I die and leave this earth, I shall have done all that I have tried to do. And if anyone sets up as my successor, my heir, my representative, then he is indeed definitely a fake. Let me repeat that once again in capital letters. I have no successors. There is no one to whom I have delegated any authority. One of the awful things about being an author who is fairly well known is the number of people who go about and claim that they are that author. For instance, not long ago I had a letter from an air hostess who said how glad she was to meet me on a recent air flight. But where was the set of autograph books which I promised her? I am confined to a wheelchair or to a bed. All my flights are made in the astral without air hostesses. There have been quite a number of instances where people have passed themselves off as me. Sometimes they have been offensive to other people, and other people have written to be complaining of my attitude. Sad, eh? Possibly this sort of thing could be stopped if everyone had identity cards, because I have had bills charged to me and all sorts of things without even knowing the first thing about it. So, you have been warned. You should know what I look like by now although I think sometimes the pictures on the covers of my books are painted by a blind man in complete darkness. Now, Lobsang Ramper, I would like your opinion in general about healing. Is it wise of a person living in the twentieth century to get herself involved in this? I mean, doctors are so clever nowadays, they can do almost anything, so are we needed? Then take the ordinary man today. He does not know what you are talking about if you tell him you can cure a headache quickly instead of him taking a lot of pills. He will tell you that you are just right for a mental home. So, I would like to hear from you. Is it wise to use this healing ability? No, it is definitely unwise to use any so-called healing ability unless one has definite medical knowledge. It is possible to have a person suffering from a very dread disease, and it is perfectly possible by hypnotism to disguise the symptoms. But although one can disguise them, one is not curing the illness. And if a person feels ill or becomes even more ill, and then goes to a doctor, well, the symptoms have been disguised, so what can the poor unfortunate doctor do? Had it not been for the disguised symptoms, the doctor possibly could have located the precise disease and cured it. Unless one has definite medical knowledge and is working with the cooperation of a registered medical practitioner, one should never, never go in for these healing things, because they can be lethal. The same goes for this prayer stunt. When a whole bunch of people get together to pray about a certain thing, unless they know the precise condition and circumstances, they may invoke the law of reversed effort, and make things a whole lot worse than they were before. So the best motto to adopt is, leave well alone. Dear, dear, a whole bunch about the same sort of thing. All right, let's have a second on this, shall we? This next question is, why is it that, say you have two people who suffer from the same type of illness, that one can be cured instantly and the other does not respond at all? The answer is, as stated above, the one person is so hypnotised that the symptoms have been disguised and you think the person is cured instantly, while the second person is not so susceptible to hypnotic suggestions, and so there is no change. Note hypnotic suggestions, because healing faith, etc., is basically of a hypnotic nature. Question. Why is it that when I heal other people, my hands become hot, but when I give myself healing they become ice cold. Answer. When you are healing or trying to heal, another person you are giving a hypnotic suggestion that he gets better, 
but you are also giving excess prana which you have available so the passage of this prana makes your hands become hot naturally you cannot give your own prana to yourself because you already have it and so you are in effect invoking the law of reversed effort and merely depleting your own energy so that your hands become cold this healing power so-called is basically hypnotic and being able to put over an acceptable suggestion to a susceptible person but healing power is also possessing a large amount of etheric energy which we will call prana and if you have this energy you may if you are versed in such things be able to convey it to another person it is like having a car which is stuck on a cold morning because the battery is low the car won't run because the battery is too low to turn over the starting motor so then another car comes along and the driver gets out and he connects his battery to the discharged battery of the stalled car then there is a large flow of energy and the stalled car starts right away that should give you an idea of how this transference of energy takes place